Um, but I'll start off by reading a quote to you from Jerry Lopez. He said, boy, that kid, the horn went, he paddled into a wave and got the best right that anyone had that morning. It was really difficult because it was on his backhand. It was one of those waves that just stayed hollow enough. He had a low line. Normally, I wouldn't have given him much of a chance of coming out, but that wave barreled all the way to the end. He popped out at the very bottom of the wave at the end. I watched the replay and the close-up on his face, and I think that even he was surprised, or he was as surprised as we all were on the beach. They gave him a perfect 10. Then he went out. He went back out and got almost as good of a ride as he did on the first one. An equally deep tube, very difficult on his backhand, unbelievable. I guess Cape Hatteras is considered the best place on the whole East Coast, and it must have taught him something because he rode those two waves really well. Somebody else covering that event said that it was a 19.67 uh, heat total out of possible 20. Even more crazy is that he had only ridden a total of three waves at backdoor in his life, and two of those, uh, and those two, two of those uh, were among the three. Under the pressure of a 25 minute heat and with thousands of people watching. You were 20 years old. This was January 29th, 2010. Can you tell me what about that experience? What led into the preparation and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, so what's funny is as soon as you started reading that quote, I knew exactly what it was. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that was during the Vulcan Pipe Pro. That was pretty, a pretty pivotal moment in my career. Um, and something I'll never forget. That was the most special contest I've ever done. I only did one more or maybe two more years of competition after that and, and, and then hung it up. Um, but yeah, that event, it was the first time I'd ever gotten into the pipe contest. The first time I had enough points to go, they had actually stopped doing it for a number of years. Uh, and I was doing the QS and the junior pros. And right when I got to the point where I started going to Hawaii when I was like 17, 18, um, I think Monster was sponsoring it at the time and they stopped doing it. So I was just like, man, come on, <laughs> I finally can do this. And it, it's not there anymore. And then 20, was it 2010 or 2000? Yeah, 2010 was the first year that it came back. Volcom brought it back and I made it in. And uh, I actually was out there with my wife and uh, my dad was out there and some family. And it was just, you know, it, it was like a really special thing to be able to get to do that. Like I'd always dreamed of competing at Pipeline and, uh, it was just a QS event, but to me, it was like a huge deal. And um, I remember that morning, you know, there were, I'd been surfing pipe for a few years. I was super familiar with it. You don't get a lot of rights out there because the, the regular footers hunt the rights, like they hawk them. So it's just hard. And for me, there's kind of like a little more play with like where the lefts break and finding the left here and there and being able to pick one off the crowd. So I just like made a niche out of figuring out where that zone was and f waiting, you know, two hours for that one left, the rights are so much harder. And where I, where I sit for the left, you're not even like in position for the rights. Um, so I'd had like, you know, maybe a handful of backdoor waves over the years, but nothing, nothing good. And, uh, you know, I remember sitting on the beach that morning, watching the event, watching it before my heat and just staring at it. And I was like, oh my gosh, it was like not big. It was good backdoor size. And I was like, man, there's some really good rights. Like, this is my chance to go right because I love going backside. And uh, I noticed guys kept getting caught out of position. Like, everyone was just, like, a little too far in a bunch of times. So when the big sets came, no, like, people were missing them. And so I decided, I was like, all right, as soon as my heat goes, like, I'm going to just be outside of everybody and be ready for, like, a bigger one. I'm going to wait for a set because those big sets were, like, the best ones. And uh Literally, we're paddling into the, you know, you sit in the channel, the horn goes off, you start paddling in to start your heat. And it was literally like, I wasn't even really fully in position yet. I hadn't even sat on my board. I was still paddling into the heat and the horn went off and a wave came and I can't remember if I went over one or I don't think I would have gone on the first one. But when I saw the next one, it was a big one. I scratched out and just, you know, I was the only one in position. Everyone else was a little too far in and uh, took off and just knifed it and it wasn't super pretty. It was like kind of chandelier, kind of messy, but it was a bigger set wave and backdoored this section and, uh, held on and then was able to doggy door it right before it closed out. And I was just like, all right, sweet. Like that was like, it happened so fast. I didn't even like necessarily process it. I like kicked, I, you know, pulled forward and started paddling back out and in my head, I'm just like, okay, cool. Like that was definitely like a seven, five or an eight, like trying to like 
you know, just set, like I knew it wasn't going to be a six cause it was a set and, um, I'm paddling back out and as I'm getting to the lineup and they, they announced that it was a 10, I just was like in total disbelief, like first wave in a heated pipe, got a 10, like, like dream things just happened. And I was like, okay, well like now I want to get another wave. <laughs> and what's funny was I sat there and waited for so long and, uh, there was no priority in the events then. I just kept waiting and waiting. And I think it'd been like, I don't know, there was only like five minutes left or something or seven minutes left. I hadn't caught another wave. And I was just like, come on, like I got to catch another wave. And so I finally ended up moving in and caught just like a medium one. It wasn't that big, but it had the perfect line on it. Like it looked so good. And uh, it was way cleaner than the first one, even though it was like maybe half the size and just took off and pig dogged into it and was able to just like butt stall and like get off and pump and butt stall. It was like so perfect. And what's funny was it was so long that it started connecting over to the reef off the wall. So there was a guy paddling out at off the wall who was like, I could see him from in the tube. And I was like, this, this guy's going to be in the way. And so I actually had to like come out early or not even early. There was like another bonus section I would have pulled into, but I had to come out and go around this guy's feet around this section. And then when I went to bottom turn, I was like all off balance from like, you know, I wasn't prepared to do that. I was all off balance. And so then I dug my rail and like fell into the wave and, uh, and so then I got like a nine, six, seven and I was just like, dang it. I would have got a 10 if that guy wouldn't have been there. <laughs> Cause I would have just pig dog through the whole next section and you know, not fallen. I was like, I got a nine, six, seven and I fell like, <laughs> he was just a free surfer? yeah, he was just free serving. Like, cause you can surf off the wall during the events. Yeah. Uh, it was just like a freak thing where, where the wave started and it, the way it peeled, it went all the way over there. You know, sometimes that happens. It's not super common. Normally where back door ends, you know, you're not quite all the way over there, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was wild. And, and that whole event, I mean, it just was like every heat I went out in, I would get a good wave. Um, I mean, I'd been surfing out there enough years. I knew how to read it and I know how to surf waves like that and getting to do it with a few people made it easier. <laughs> uh, but it was also wild. It wasn't like perfect pipeline, you know, it was, a uh, kind of a more like bigger Northwest, North Northwest swell. So there was like lots of wash throughs on the big days and it was tough, but um, you know, made it all the way to the semifinals. You know, my wife's there, my dad was there, got to see me surfing. And, um, it, I, and it was kind of funny. My, my biggest regret is in the semis. I decided, I was like, you know what, I'm going to ride a smaller board. Cause it wasn't that big anymore. And I just, I like riding small boards. I was like, this is my chance. Like I'll ride a small board. Like it's a semifinals, whatever I can do it. Well, everyone else in the heat was still surfing to win the heat. And so they had bigger boards and were able to out paddle me and sit, sit further out, sit deeper. And I was kind of like, it was a huge competitive error. Um, but, and so I ended up losing in the semis. I think I got third, maybe, um, maybe I got fourth anyway. Uh, so I lost kind of due to an equipment error, but I did have a wave in the semis that was like crazy this back door wave that i like free fell into and butt stalled and when i pulled up i was a little deep and i started pumping i was on the foam ball just barely making on the foam ball and this thing's starting to doggy door or starting to close out and i tried to doggy door it and i just wore the lip on the back of the head and it was funny because uh from the announcer's standpoint like they couldn't see me like from the tents no one could see me and then it wasn't until they saw the the uh replay from like the off the wall angle where they were like, oh my gosh, he almost made that. <laughs> and um, yeah, I remember, you know, I was like so close. I was like, if I made that, it would have been our 10, 100%. And I was paddling back out and, you know, it takes a while to paddle back out from back door to get through all the white water and back and into the channel at pipe. And while I'm paddling back out, like Mark Matthews and, or who was it? Uh, Danny Fuller and I think Danny Fuller and Mark Matthews or whoever, Anthony Walsh, I don't remember who it was in the heat, but they had, uh, they had everyone comboed. <laughs> so I was like, well, even if I got a 10, I wouldn't have made it. There wasn't enough time to catch a wave. So it was like, it was like a cool way to end it with like something exciting. But you know, from, from the first heat to the last, like that is something, it seems like it just happened yesterday. You know, it was, really? it's like, yeah, what it's like 13 years ago now. And it, it still just runs through my head. So clear as day. Uh, I'm going to record on my phone. I think is the move so that I, we don't have to swap my so the, uh, Jer the part of Jerry's quote where he says, wow, you know, it must have something to do with Cape Hatteras. 
What about growing up here, do you think, prepared you for that experience? Oh, the, the ocean here is pretty uh, unforgiving. Okay. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. I mean, it, it's funny because everyone thinks that the East Coast is like small, you know, weak, windswell, whatever. But we're pretty close to the continental shelf. And even places like Jersey and New York that aren't, um, or anywhere, you know, when we get a heavy swell, it doesn't necessarily have to be like 17 to 20 seconds to have power. You know, when you start talking waves that are below sea level and whatnot, you know, they're thicker than they are tall or whatever, like just heavy, heavy waves, um, at beach breaks, you get pounded. Uh, you learn to take off late, you know, short period, I think, there's definitely a whole different ball game to a long period as well. And taking off on a, a, a heavy wave that's got long period energy in it so much harder, but, um, learning to just free fall out of the sky in eight to 10 second period swell. That's, you know, six to 12 feet, whatever it be. Um, you have to be fast. You have to paddle hard. You have to be able to read all these like random little things that are happening in the face you know, quick because you don't have time. You don't see the wave at a distance and be like, oh, I can, you know, here's where it's going to go. Or you're not at a reef break where you know where it's going to break or a rock or whatever. Um, it's just you pop up and you got eight to 10 seconds before that you have to be on the wave already. So your reflexes are fast, your wave knowledge and reading the wave, you know, you, you figure out how to do it quick. And so applying that to Hawaii, you just scale it up. You know, the waves are bigger. So you kind of, I remember when I first, the first year or second year I went, I was, I would get ahead of myself a lot when I would catch, you know, like a 20 foot face at Hawaii, I would, at pipeline, I would be bottom turning and I'd be trying to go down the line fast, like sooner than I wasn't even at the bottom of the wave. Cause I just wasn't quite used to that time yet yeah. of like dropping into a wave that big. Um, so it's like those things that you have to adjust, but the feeling the timing of paddling for it the understanding of where to be and what to do. It's, it's, it's all the same because you know, it's, it's just a scaled up version. <laughs> yeah. Fascinating. Um, how did your family end up here? Uh, my dad, both my dad and my mom moved here out of high school, um, from Virginia. Okay. And so, and then they met down here, they didn't move here together. Um, and so my dad, you know, I think my dad moved here with my uncle when he was 18 and started working, started a construction business together down the road. Uh, they bought a piece of property and, you know, built on, built on the land together. And they've been here ever since, <laughs> basically straight out of high school. Why'd your mom move down here? Uh, she just like, I guess, I don't really necessarily know why she moved down here. She just liked going to the beach. Okay. Yeah, that <laughs> she, makes sense. She really liked taking photos of windsurfers too. She used to take, you know, when windsurfing was like a big thing. Yeah, yeah. She would take photos of windsurfers. I don't think she did that out of high school though, so... It just blows my mind that this was that anybody would have stopped and built here originally. <laughs> like whoever was passing through to decide, like I'm going to invest my life savings or whatever it is to build. Yeah, because it seems um, it's so vulnerable, you know. Yeah, I mean now nowadays it's different because people look at it as like real estate and investment and like making money out of it. But anyone that came here before, you know. You, it took a certain kind of person and it still takes a certain kind of person to live here. You know, anybody can buy a house here and rent it out. Um, but to live here is a whole different ball game, you know, dealing with the weather, dealing with the elements, dealing with the, the winter and there being nothing around, everything's closed, whatever. Um, so I think that it's like a, it's a different version of the same people that came here for the, for the first time you came here because it's beautiful because there's no one at the beaches and it's pristine and, it's special. You have the ocean on one side and the sound on the other, you know, the fishing and the hunting and all the things that you can do here away from civilization. That is what makes it special. And, uh, you know, to enjoy that, you just have to endure the rest. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I kind of want to unpack, uh, the environment a little bit because a lot of people yeah. don't know what the outer banks are. And even on the West coast, I'm in, I'm from California. I told people I'm coming to the outer banks and they're like, where is that again? Is that North yeah. Carolina, you know? And I'm like, yeah. Uh, but on the East Coast, everybody knows what it is. Yeah. And everybody comes for vacation. So it's a depositional barrier islands, essentially, off the coast. Is it about 30 miles off the coast of North Carolina? Yeah, I think, I think someone told me that Buxton's like 25 miles from the mainland. But maybe it's, maybe it's more. I don't, I don't know. 
Okay, well, um, we are... Something, somewhere in that range. <laughs> it's a narrow strip of land, essentially, or a series of islands. Yeah, so, te- like, because, you know, the northern Outer Banks, like Nags Head, Kildova Hills, Kitty Hawk, Kerala, Duck, like, that's the Outer Banks, but technically that's the mainland. Like, that, is, you know, they're, it's a peninsula. Like, that peninsula comes down off of Virginia, technically. Okay. Um, because you can drive, if you wanted to, you could drive from Oregon Inlet on the Nags Head side on the beach all the way to the Chesapeake Bay. Okay. Um, but it is still just like a tiny strip of sand. Uh, and then once you hit Oregon Inlet, then, you know, Cape Hatteras and Ocracoke, Cape Lookout, that's where it's like the Outer Banks. Um, down south, like Cape Lookout, I don't technically know where that, like most of us consider the Outer Banks to be like Ocracoke to Kitty Hawk area or Duck. Um, and then below that is like the core banks or then you have core banks and then I'm not even super knowledgeable in what everyone refers to it down there as people in Southern North Carolina will like to say that they're part of the outer banks (laughs) and technically, technically not like politically speaking or whatever, you know, the whole coast is made up of outer banks off the coast. Um, but when people refer to the Outer Banks of North Carolina, it's, you know, Ocracoke to Duck and Corolla area. Got it. So there's the sound on one side, like you said, that divides the Outer Banks from the mainland. And it's up to 30 miles uh, distance between those two bodies of yeah. land. And then the strip of the Outer Banks itself is, I think, three miles wide at the widest point and only 150 yards wide at the narrowest point. Yeah which is kind of crazy. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, it's a really unique environment. And like you said, there's tons of hunting. I saw a deer on the side of the road this morning. Yeah, no one really hunts the deer here, though, because you can uh, certain, you know, in season or certain places, because we are also in a national park. Okay. Um, but there are places you can, but no one does because they just eat uh, like berries and grass and stuff. They're not very... I, I've been told that the deer meat here isn't that good. Everybody that hunts deer goes off island, but but duck hunting is huge here. Lots of people hunt ducks in the winter. And phenomenal fishing, obviously. Yeah, the, fi- the fishing is amazing. Sound side, ocean side. We actually have really good freshwater fishing too for bass and stuff in the ponds. Um, offshore, inshore, like it's got it all. Which. <laughs> And then as it relates to the beach, sand dunes endlessly throughout the entirety of it and empty surf. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because, like, it, it is more crowded nowadays, as anywhere. I mean, it doesn't matter where you go in the world, it's more crowded. Um, but it is still, it just blows my mind anytime I pull up over the dune and, you know, find some, like, waisted chest high, shoulder high surf that's, like, glassy and, like, just perfect little shape and there's no one around. Like, that still have it still blows my mind then, 2023, that still happens. And it's just, it's because of where we are, you know, we're, we're an hour from like the main population of, of the county up the beach. Uh, you know, we're two, three hour, three hours from, from Virginia, the population of surfers in Virginia beach. And we're five hours from Southern North Carolina surfers. So people aren't just driving here to, to surf on like an average day. I mean, more so now than they used to, but when we have those little moments where the weather just flips and something changes and you know, it was unexpected, it's empty. And that, and even if you do drive down here to surf, there's known spots, yeah. of course, that people will go to, but then it seems like there's tons of just random unknown spots that maybe even shift depending on what the sand is doing on a given tide and swell. But if you're dialed into those things and you have a few friends who are dialed in, you could probably find empty good you know, surf to yourself. You can find them and you can blow them out at the same time. <laughs> so it's like, it's uh, it can be a, a tricky game of like who you let know, like when you do find those spots, like who you let know because... If you let the wrong person know, then everyone knows. And uh, all of a sudden, it's one of the spots. But they change so much. I mean, even even for me, like that's what I do for a living is drive up and down and find the best sandbars. And, um, you know, there's times where you know, like, oh, this spot's like this and this is like this. And you can, after checking everything, like after we get a big swell or a long flat spell and we have a little wave again, I'll literally drive from Buxton to Pea Island and just look everywhere. Every few miles, I pull over to scout the beach and see what the sand does. And it's just always, it always changes. Like all these places that I would have, like when I was younger, I used to kind of write off zones and never look at them. And then I got older and I was like, well, what if? And so I started looking and realized that like, oh, like 
the good zones that we always thought are good do sometimes get bad and the things the zones we always thought were bad do sometimes get good and vice versa is just sand i mean it right. it moves and so that's what makes it exciting is like you're just always hunting there's always a, a search out there you're always looking for waves and it, it keeps it exciting yeah i'm enamored by it to be perfectly honest <laughs> I, I love it and the funny thing is um it's so all the tourist trap kind of kitschy big stores like the wing stores and even the restaurants that are cheesy is actually a detraction from how great the place is. It's, yeah. Like if you, yeah, if bad. I think that so many of those tourists have no awareness of all the water activities that you can be doing. Yeah. I've only ever been focused on the water activities. So all of the touristiness of it, um, feels offensive to me. It feels offensive to us too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. No, but, I mean, but that's the draw for everybody in Washington yeah. DC. Right. And that's, and that's, and that's part of being a, you know, unincorporated village, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's not a whole lot of rules on what can and can't be done or whatever. So there's just all kinds of random stores around here. Yeah. It's so random, Yeah, but it's funny. Um, it's funny. Cause it's like, it's the one, it's the thing that makes us special is like, we're not like everywhere else, but then the, it's because it's like a little wild, but then because it's a little wild, like there's just, you, then you get all the junk too. <laughs> yeah. It's a really unique place. Um, did your parents have any ambition for what they wanted you to do professionally with your life? Um, no, actually. Uh, which it's kind of funny cause I don't think my dad knew. Um, but he saw that I had like an ability, um, to make a living surfing. And, uh, when, like him and my mom split up when I was 12. And so then he was, he was taking care of me and he was working two jobs to be able to, you know, take care of both of us. And then, you know, would drive me to contests on the week, like whenever we had an event and I, but I was performing, I was like getting good results. And my sponsors were like starting to, you know, provide fun budgets and funds for me to travel. And so like, he saw that as like, okay, like if these companies can, can help then like that alleviates some pressure off of him and uh you know it just each year it kind of kept growing like honestly from the time I was 13 till I don't know when it just was like you know I would like redo contracts every year or every other year and it just like kept growing and so he saw that and knew that like I had an opportunity and didn't ever you know tell me like oh you need to be doing something else or you should try something else or don't bother he he just always encouraged me and uh provided a way for me to to make it happen and it's pretty cool that you know i mean we still talk about it sometimes i'll bring it up and i'm just like like thank him you know because without his support and uh you know just willingness to let me try and fail if it if that even if that was what the outcome was uh you know he gave me the, gave me the chance <laughs> and so yeah i made it happen it's <laughs> amazing um your first video on YouTube was published on February 15th, 2006. Oh, gee. I've been around <laughs> the Inter whole time. <laughs> so it is the whole time because, yeah. interestingly, YouTube was launched almost exactly one year to the day yep. prior. Yours was February 15th. They launched on February 14th. Oh, no way. Okay. I knew, it was, I knew it was the beginning of 2005. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was yeah, literally funny. one day and <laughs> one year before you published your first video. So do you remember what that first video was that you uploaded? I know the first couple. I don't remember. I remember one of my first ones was like a wipeout video. That's what it is. That it's is called, the first video. Yeah, it's titled Wipeouts of, wipeouts <laughs> wipeouts of, of Me. <laughs> I watched that not that long ago. <laughs> it's a smart way to launch your channel because <laughs> everybody loves a wipeout section. Yeah. And especially at that time on YouTube, <clears throat> it was like... It was like America's Funniest Videos, yeah, kind yeah. of. You know, you want to see people falling. Yeah, it was funny because I was making videos. I've been making videos since I was 12, 12 or 13. So like 2002, 2003. And, uh, but I didn't have anything anywhere to put them. And then there's a website that I was, I did upload some stuff to, like pre-YouTube. I don't remember what it was. Is. Years, a long time ago even, I tried finding it and finding my login and I, I couldn't find it. Um, it, but it was like somewhere that people uploaded videos prior to YouTube launching. And, uh, and so then when YouTube launched, you know, a year in, I was like, okay, like this is perfect. I can put all my stuff here. And, um, you know, just basically that was my way 
of being able to show my sponsors like what I was doing. Like that was my outlet because living out here, you, you know, the industry doesn't see you. They don't see anything. And, um, I remember when I was like 14, so 2004, I like email or I mailed a DVD to like O'Neill with footage of me for a movie they were making. But like, I, I think it was like write only, like I didn't email it as files. I emailed it as, or I mailed, I keep saying email. I mailed it as a movie. And so they couldn't even use the files. So I didn't make it in the movie. And so I was just like, man. But it was like a sponsor me tape, essentially. Well, I was already sponsored. Oh, you were? Yeah, okay. yeah. I started writing for them when I was 11. Oh, okay. Um, but they were making like a movie called The O'Neill Kids Are All Right. Or it was The Kids Are All Right. And, uh, and so there was like a montage section of the team at the end. And I, I got to be in it, or I would have been in it if I knew how to <laughs> mail them clips, but I didn't know how. So, so then once you know, things were more digital by 2005, 2006, being able to put stuff on YouTube, be like, hey, this is what I'm doing. And like, just show my abilities, show that I'm like doing things and I'm being active aside from like, you know, amateur competitions. Or I guess at that point I was doing junior pros. Um, that was big for me. YouTube was like my outlet. The fact that you had the foresight to even uh, <coughs> provide that for O'Neill on your own. I mean, was your dad telling you to do that? No. That was all just self-starter. Yeah. No, I just like... I was just into it. I was like kind of like a tech geek, even as like a kid, like early, so you know, like I was, I had like a, a handy cam and I would like film like finger surfing and on the carpet. And like, I was trying to like record it to it. Cause I didn't know how to make a movie at the time. I was like 11 or something, 10 or 11 or 12. And I didn't know how to make a movie. So I was like, okay, well maybe, maybe you put headphones over the speaker or, or over the mic of the camera. And I would like, hit play and like try and film it and then hit pause and then try and film the next scene. And I like hit play on the audio and try and film it and hit pause to like have the audio play. It didn't work. Obviously. Um, I found that out. Um, but like, that's how like into it I was. I was like, okay, like how can I problem solve this? And then, uh, eventually got windows movie maker. <laughs> right. That's <laughs> and, amazing. And figured that out and it got easier. <laughs> you're, you're perfectly positioned for what was to come yeah. with media and like this, you vlog landscape. And I know I had no stuff. idea. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, but let's talk about the vlog because when did you start to recognize the potential of a quote vlog as opposed to just uploading content onto YouTube? So it kind of, it's basically my whole career. It's almost kind of annoying because my whole career has been just constant transition. The whole surf economy and the, the surf industry has just like, you know, when I started, like when I first got sponsored and stuff, it was like, oh, contests, like that's the only way to do it. And then as I was like a teenager, it was like, oh, you can do it through magazines, like free surfing. You know, Dane Reynolds was, was like at the time, you know, doing his, like that was when he blew up and he started leading the way. Like prior to Dane, there weren't that many free surfing pros. Um, and you know, some, but not many. And then it was like, that was when the time started. Where it was like, Hey, you can, you can make a name for yourself in magazines and in video parts and not even have to do contests. And, uh, I was still doing events cause I thought that's what I was supposed to do. And, um, but I was starting to do, I was really into the video as I told you. So I was like doing the video stuff on the side already just to like make movies. I liked making movies, like making edits. And, um, you know, then it transitioned into, into magazines and through my whole teenage into my early twenties, it was like mag, mag focused while I'm still doing the movie thing. And it started transitioning into like, okay, we make, you know, everyone on the internet like makes parts of themselves and that's how you, you know, that's what you do. It's an edit. If you're not in a movie, like something, you know, Lost Atlas or a Taylor Steele movie or whatever, like and you make an edit online and it goes, you know, tens of thousands of people see it. It's just as good. Um, but then, you know, magazines died, started to die off. The edits started to get super oversaturated. Like everyone was just dropping crazy edits all the time. And so then like views were going down. I was seeing it. Um, and I had already gone through the phase, like during the whole mag era where there were, where there were blogs, you know, Sterling Spencer, Dion Aegis, um, Matt Wilkinson had one, uh, Alex gray, like guys that had like the big ones. And so I had one actually, I had like, it was, <laughs> As a joke, when I made it, we made it brettgnarly.com. And then the whole Volcom pipe thing happened, with, and they started calling me Gnarly Barley. 
but and so then it looked like I made the blog named that because of the Volcom thing and I was like no no it was the opposite like um but I would make edits you know kind of vlogs that I would put on YouTube and use that to to embed onto my blog and um I was never that great at it because I was like trying to put photos on there and type stuff and like it just wasn't wasn't me the the video aspect clicked way more so um, as I, you know, we started transitioning again in the surf industry out of mags, out of those like single edits. Um, I had been thinking of doing a vlog for a while because I followed some fishermen that do it like bass fishermen whose things, you know, followings had taken off and that's what they were doing full time. I was super into the videos and I started seeing that Ben, Ben Grave, Ben Gravy, um, was starting to have a ton of success with his. And I hesitated for like two years on starting it just out of like pride because I liked what I did. I liked making action videos that were just surfing and making it to whatever music I wanted and it being that. But I basically got to the point where I was like, look, like magazines are struggling. Like we're basically surfers were basically turning into their own media outlet. And I already have a YouTube channel with a bunch of followers. Like if I start doing a vlog, like maybe it'll do well. And so I actually reached out to Ben and talked to him about it to see like, is it profitable? Like, does it work? Like how much do you have, like how many edits do you have to make? How, how long, like all the, you know, asking all the questions. And, um, he gave me like the real nudge to like, dude, you should do it. Just do it. Like, don't worry about what anyone else is going to say. Like if you think you should do it and like, he's like, people are going to be psyched. And so, you know, what was it that, that was January, 2018. And so for like two months, I started kind of planning how I would do it. And I told myself, I'd give myself like, okay, I'll do six months of like doing one a week. If they do well, I'll keep doing it. If not, I'll just go back to doing what I was. And, um, you know, came up with like an intro video and an intro song that I would be able to play at the beginning of, cause I wanted them to be like an, an episode. Like I wanted it to be like a series again, you know, this goes all the way back 20 years ago now to me falling in love with making movies and uh or making edits and um so yeah that march of 2018 i launched like the first episode it was horrible <laughs> but then my next two my next two videos the waves were really good i went to jersey scored came back here it was huge got good waves and like that whole march the waves were good into april and all the videos just started like really perform like outperforming the videos that i would spend way more time on previously you know, like when you're making an edit for like three months or a season or even for a swell, I would put so much more time into the song and the clips and making sure everything was like perfect. And then the vlogs I was just making and they were performing better. And I was like, OK, so people it was kind of a gut punch because I was like, oh, people don't care about the quality, <laughs> which they don't. Well, like, they don't understand the vast majority of people it, don't yeah. understand the nuance of the slightly better top turn than somebody else's. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, or the quality of the editing, I mean, so much. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, or the quality of the turns. Like that it was more and it took me a while to like even under like understand that more, which I can explain in a minute, but yeah, when it launched and it started taking off within like 4 weeks, I was just like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Like this is working. It was working fast enough that I was like, this is working, this is what I'll do. And um you know, at that point the only magazine left was like the Surfer's Journal. <laughs> And, uh, as far as print. Yeah. And so I, uh, yeah, just kind of sunk into that route and went on to that for like four or five, the last four or five years. So when Ben gave you advice, what, what did the investment look like on your end? And, um, what was the return on that investment? Was it strictly from YouTube revenue or what? Uh, no, I mean, it was more like the investment was more so time. Cause I already had a camera that I was shooting other stuff with. Um, but you need a filmer. Right, right. Well, but I already need, I was already doing that, um, and making edits anyway. So like I already had budget, like I already spent, was spending part of my budget from O'Neill to pay whoever to film at the time. I mean, at that point I had already been shooting with, uh, Jeffrey O'Neill who works at real now for two years. Um, so it still was going to be the same. Like every, every time we shot, I was going to have to pay him. Uh, I had a solo shot and GoPro, so like I would make episodes out of that too. But definitely for the first couple of years, it was like <laughs> I was paying Jeffrey a lot <laughs> at the end of the year when we do taxes, and like I'd have to like 
you know, W9, um, W2, W9. Yeah, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> 10, 1099. I'd have to 1099 him. And, uh, and I was just like, whoa, this is kind of gnarly. But like, that was what was bringing in the rest. And it was covered. Like, I had budget to do it. But um, yeah, I mean, it was investment. Like, I wouldn't have been able to make those episodes without him. Um, not as well as I did. And, uh, but again, like I, I was doing that for all the years before, but less because I was, you know, it was just like, oh, well, it's not going to be that good. Like, I'm not going to pay someone to shoot today. Whereas then it turned into like, oh, well I need to shoot. And so then I would pay. Um, but it took, you know, it didn't necessarily, it made like some money the first year. It's funny. Cause like everyone always wonders like how much you can make off YouTube videos. And there's like no <laughs> rhyme or reason to it. Like somebody could get 500,000 views and make like a hundred bucks or somebody could make 500,000 views and make like five grand. Like it just depends on the length of the video, the ads that are on it, how many ads they put in it. There's like so how long people watch it. Um, there's just so many different things that, that go into it. So it was like kind of, I was realizing like, okay, this is like helps like side income, but it wasn't a whole lot. Um, but it did provide me, you know, a following and a place to like share my surfing, share my stories, took people out, just like share my adventures with people. And that was like bringing, um, you know, relevance to my name and like my image and what I do, uh, which then helped all my spot. It was good for all my sponsors. Yeah. So they were all stoked on it. And so that's where like more of the value came in. Like without my sponsors, I couldn't have just done YouTube on my own. Um, you have to be very successful to just do it on your own. Yeah. Um, I don't know how, like the way some people do it, I don't even know how they pull it off. It's like amazing. <laughs> well, I think part of your success and those people's success probably is related to creating a plan of content and yeah. sticking to the plan and yeah, being yeah. consistent with the plan. Right. So, um, you were saying one a week yeah. was the objective. Yeah. That was the plan. And I, is that a 40 hour work week or like, what does that actually yeah, come down pretty to? Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what, that's what was gnarly doing one a week. And again, this is, remember I told you that the quality, the viewer doesn't need desire or appreciate the quality that I like to put out. Just like people don't care. They want to see the surfing. They want to hear the story, see the surfing. They're not worried about if it's color corrected, if the song's timed perfect, all these, all these things that I obsess over because I love making them. Um, so I could have definitely put in like a third of the time or less to then make like my return on investment way higher, but my brain doesn't work that way. I like to put out quality. Like I like to have my name behind whatever I'm putting out. Like I was already sacrificing so much by picking the music I was to make these videos, to make it royalty free music, to be able to make money off of it. So that to me was like, okay, if I'm sacrificing that, cause that's a big part. Music to me is like bad music can make a, a great video bad. Yeah. Um, so with that sacrifice, I was like, the rest has to be top notch. And so, yeah, I mean, honestly, I, uh, it was pretty much always Monday through Thursday. I'd work from like eight in the morning until six. Um, or five or something, do dinner. And then uh, typically on Wednesday, typically on Wednesday night, I would, I would put, we'd put the kids to bed and then I'd work until like 11 or 12 trying to finish it to get it exported. And then Thursday morning I'd be uploading and doing the thumbnail and all that stuff to put it out. <laughs> so I was like, I was basically jamming a 40 hour work week into like, I mean, I don't know what the actual math is, but it was something like that between Monday morning and like midday or early out afternoon Thursday <laughs> and then you'd have Friday and Saturday Sunday off uh typically I, I wouldn't have Friday off because then I would start working on Instagram stuff because like to be able to do all the YouTube stuff like my Instagram stuff was kind of struggling um so I'd use I would still edit on fr Thursday I would maybe take Thursday afternoon off or or part of Friday but I still had other stuff I had to do so it was like it was a lot um because then, if, and then what's the kicker is then all of a sudden you get waves on like, I hated when I would get waves on like Monday through Wednesday. I was so bummed because I had made this schedule. First of all, this wasn't some schedule. Someone was like, Hey, you have to do this. Like O'Neill didn't call me. I was like, Hey, we want videos out every Thursday. Like I made this up because I wanted it to work and I wanted it to be like structured. And so then when we were like filming Monday, Tuesday, I was just like editing at night 
or then I wouldn't have a weekend. So I would work, I would know there was going to be waves. So I'd work like Friday, Saturday film and then edit at night. And then, you know, it was just whatever I would move it around and basically just lose a weekend or something. But even though you didn't have a boss telling you to stick to that schedule, the reality is you have viewers yeah. who have an expectation and they want to see that video every Thursday. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of your boss. Yeah. And it, I mean, I, I'm just hard on myself, so I just, <laughs> but you know that they have that expectation and that's yeah. why you're hard on yourself. I, I was, I mean, I will, it well, I wasn't one of the people that's like every day or every Thursday at 10 AM. Like I know that Ben maybe at one point, I know Jamie at one point was like every Tuesday and Thursday or Tuesday and Friday at like whatever time they had a video out, but I wasn't that specific. So if it ended up being Friday, I was okay with that. Or if it was Wednesday Eve, if I like had an easy one, cause it was like one session or something, it was like Wednesday morning, but I always tried to do Thursday cause it seemed like it performed the best. So that was like kind of my, it just seemed, although now I've learned that that wasn't as good of a day <laughs> or time. Um, and then when it comes to the content itself, like what you were making in the videos, how did you design that content? So I just wanted it again, like I said, I wanted it to be more like a series. I didn't want it to just be a straight up like talking vlog and, uh, you know, this is me going surfing and some surf action. Like I wanted to, I like telling a story. Um, so I always in my head, I always was like, okay, there'll be like the teaser clips that started the intro, which like each intro I've made three. So I've done like three seasons. Season three has drug, drug out the longest because I, I took a little break. Um, but season one and two, it was like one a week and I had intro videos. And then after the intro, it's like, I always wanted to start it with B roll, whether it was drone shots or, you know, uh, just landscape, nature shots, sunrise, driving, whatever, some sort of B roll that leads into the surf that leads into me talking about why I'm going surfing and then the action. And then, you know, depending on whether it's like two days of surf or two sessions in one day, then the, I would break up the sessions by, with some talking, do session two or day two, and then like a wrap up. And I always like to do in the wrap up and I don't even know why, cause I don't, I've never even queried like if anyone likes it. <laughs> I, and I've never actually even looked at my audience retention to see like how many people, like if all of the videos just die off right when I start talking at the end, I just, there's some weird thing inside me that likes to like kind of break down the session or break down the day or whatever. And I know that some people enjoy that. So I just, I, that's just how I ended up doing it. And so what's funny is at a point I kind of was like, do I need to do that? Would it be better if I didn't do that? Well, I'm just going to do it anyway. <laughs> so that's kind of like, that was basically the structure. So then when it goes into filming, I'm like thinking about all those things. The moment I like pack all my, pack my camera bags and stuff before I leave the house, it's like, okay, I need all these shots before I surf. I need all these shots after I surf and stuff like that. You're wearing a lot of hats, producer, yeah. director, yeah. editor. Yeah. Cause Jeffrey just, Jeffrey just did the action. Yeah. Um, he would film some B roll stuff or lifestyle stuff. We were just casually, you know, if he had his camera out or once we were at the beach and he was set up, but everything else I filmed, um, and myself. So it was like, it was a lot. <laughs> how do you, uh, factor, how do surf trips factor into this? So I actually haven't really done, but like one or two surf trips that were for the vlog. Um, why not funds? <laughs> uh, basically I used all, yeah, basically just funds. Yeah. Um, I haven't, I don't have the money to just do, to like, fly me and Jeffrey. We could do like one trip a year. Um, but each year it ends up, I have to use those funds to cover something else to travel. Um, so like all the trips I mostly do are either for a project. So I can't make a vlog or for a catalog shoot. So I can't make a vlog. <laughs> um, we've done a couple, like I went to Tahiti and I made a vlog out of that. What's funny was it wasn't meant to be a vlog. It was meant to be a surf line project long story they kind of towed me into a closeout um or the guy heading up the project towed me into a closeout and i was on my way to tahiti and found out that it wasn't actually a surfline trip and that i wasn't actually staying with the guys he told me that i was going to be staying with so then all of a sudden i was like okay well i'm taking this over <laughs> and so i bought footage from guys when i got there and i filmed some stuff and made it you know gotcha. made it my own so that, um other than that i went to waco documented that um 
haven't really documented like going anywhere else. I just get so content with here. I have no, I have no huge desire. I love traveling. I love surfing new waves, but I have no huge desire or enough funds. (laughs) Um, you talked about doing three different seasons. How is a season, how long is a season structured and how much time do you take off? So the first season was 2018 to late 2000, no, yeah, to, to, to mid 2019, summer 2019. So it was a, almost a year and a half. And then I started season two in 2009, uh, August 2019 with, uh, the last Namibia trip I did, which was the best I ever got it. And then see So season two ran until I want to say the end of 2020 or mid mid 20 or no, it was about a year. So I guess it was like August or September, 2020. Um, and then season three, I launched at the end of 2020 and it's still going okay. right. No, that doesn't make sense. Sorry. No, I guess that does make sense. Yeah, it would have been 21, 21, 22, and now we're into 23. Um, And I had planned on this past January, like wrapping it up and starting a new one, but there was a whole just, there was a lot of stuff going on that like basically backed me up from finishing edits for like months. (laughs) And uh, a lot of mental stuff going on too that, Last year was just gnarly, honestly, for me mentally. Like last year, I stopped doing one a week. I was getting, you know, because I was four years in to this one a week. And I was like, honestly, getting burnt out. Because at that point, I thought I would have enough funds to be able to like pay somebody to help me. And it was just like, I didn't have any help still. And um, so I was like, okay, I'll do like every other week or just like when there's swell. And so I still always had like videos to edit. But then I found myself last summer, like just at my computer all summer trying to play catch up on edits. And uh, I was like, I'm not going fishing or like spending as much time with my kids at the beach. Like I wasn't taking advantage of the perks of the job. Like I already don't make, it's not like I make like a killing off of what I do. So like the benefit is the perks, like getting to travel, getting to like see my family whenever I want and like have that leniency to be my own boss. So I was like, I'm not even taking advantage of the perks. Like, what am I doing? And so kind of played catch up through the winter and am in the middle of a huge restructuring. <laughs> but have a currently working, like basically each episode or each season ends. When each season ends, I do like a highlight reel of everything that happened through that season. Because like there will be like epic clips that get mixed in with like not a killer video. Or, you know, maybe I only got one crazy air or one crazy barrel or a couple even. And so I like making the highlight reel that's like goes back to the movies that I first made when I was a teenager and and that I've always liked making where it's like just the, you know, just the B-roll and the action and the music that I want. I don't, all those highlight reels, I just use whatever I want. I don't worry about royalty free stuff because I'm like, I want it to be good. I, I like having my name on those. And so the one that I'm planning for the end of this year, uh, is like way more in depth. It's like actually more like surf movie esque, I guess. Uh, it'll still be like a highlight reel of stuff, but I'm hoping to do at least one trip that I'm not going to cover vlog or post anything about. That'll be part of that to make it more like a movie. So anyway, that was kind of a longer drawn out answer, but no, that's okay. <laughs> it's um, a, it's a <laughs> work in progress answer, I guess. <laughs> the, uh, you referenced it, but I was going to ask you how you discovered Skeleton Bay and tell me about that first trip. So the first time I heard of it was obviously when, when Corey Lopez went back in 2008, I think when they scored it. And, uh, actually that winter 2009, I was at a O'Neill contest down at Sebastian Inlet and we were all, the whole team was staying at a house and I was talking with him and him and Alec Parker, maybe. And, uh, and they told me where it was and I was just like, Oh my gosh, I know where it is, but I had no idea how to get there. <laughs> and, um, so for years I just always dreamed to go in there. And then finally, once I was older, you know, I think when I was 26, 25 or 20, 25. So 2015, I started looking at forecasts for there and trying to be like, okay, I'm going to go. And, uh, didn't just kind of like 
didn't know what to look for. Corey had kind of told me, and then I don't remember what 2005 did, but 2006 or 2016, I was like, okay, we're going to go. And I was going to go with him. Like we were planning to go. I was like, all right, this is sick. Like he knows where to go. He knows the whole deal. Like I'm in. And it, there was one swell in April we didn't go for. And Koa Smith and Anthony Walsh and some guys went. And Koa, that's when Koa got his 27-second barrel, the long GoPro clip that everyone's seen. And I, we were just like, I was like really bummed. But Corey was like, man, the swell was super, like, it didn't look that good. Like, we'll get another one because it was early. It was like, normally swells don't hit that early. There was not another swell the rest of the year. And I was so bummed. And so then in 2017... You know, it's back on the radar. I'm like, we're going to go. And a big swell popped up. Huge swell. It wasn't like a, a crazy good angle, but it was it was massive. And so, you know, we kind of, we started to pull the trigger and actually Surfline and O'Neill partnered to send Corey and I uh, with a filmer to go. And um, that's one of the most memorable trips of my life. Like walking up and looking at Skeleton Bay for the first time with Corey Lopez and my buddy Oliver Kurtz. Uh, it's just even it was like waist high and just the most perfect peeling barrel it's too small when it's when it's that small but uh that trip was so special like it's funny because i have like these songs that i was listening to at the time like on you know you have your songs like throughout each year there's like periods of time where you're like into certain songs so i had these songs that i was i don't know if i was trying to make an edit to or i was listening to whatever but i have these songs from that season and it's like whenever they come up on my spotify it's just like boom i'm like right there again music does that yeah for it's sure. so cool it just takes me back and yeah. that was that was really special so i don't know how long i don't know how well i would have scored or how long it would have taken me to get there without without Corey. um so, so cool. but you guys scored on that trip yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah it was it was like now that i've gone a couple times and i know it better it was not a killer swell it was good um, and it was big and there were some crazy waves, but it wasn't the classic like 20, like I think Corey got a really long one. Not many people were getting really long barrels. Like the whole, t the whole day I didn't get a barrel more than that was even 10 seconds. Oh, wow. And I was like, okay. And like, I think my longest one was like eight and my longest one here at home is like six or seven. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> yeah. this should be way longer. Totally. And, uh, now that I know what I know, it was just because of the angle and stuff. It, it wasn't or the period, I forget, but it, uh, it wasn't that classic, you know, super long, crazy barrels, but they were really, really heavy. It was so heavy. Um, and I loved every minute of it. I mean, I got like six barrels on one wave. Like you're, you were getting a lot of barrels, but it wasn't the continuous. Whereas when I went back in 2018 and 19, each time they were like longer and longer. Um, so slowly dialing in what what works better <laughs> and are you is it still on the radar like every year basically? oh yeah yeah i look at it every year it didn't break the last few few years i mean you couldn't get there because of covid um and i think even last year was pretty hard to get there i think this year is a little bit easier tickets are just tickets got really hard one of the airlines stopped flying there for a period of time um but it looks doable now uh and I looked at that swell that just happened like a month ago, pretty hard with two of my friends. Um, but we all decided it as good as we've gotten it, <laughs> I'm not going to go back for less. Gotcha. Like, and we knew that that was going to be less. We knew it'd be good and it would break, but we knew it was going to be less. And I was like, I can't, if we go, but if you go back after scoring a wave like that, that hard and it's not even, it's not nearly as good. You just, it's gonna hurt. It's gonna sting a little bit. Well, the amount of time, the amount of the amount of money you yeah. put into it, it's it's the it's the most expensive trip I've ever done. How long do you have to stay for when you go? I mean, the wave only breaks for a day. Oh, really? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. So you want it? You want to know it's good. And what's travel time like? What is that trip look like? Um, How many days? So, turnaround time. If you like strike there and back, you can do it in a week because it takes two days to get there. You, I, you really, really want to be there a day early um, in case your bags don't show up. So there's three days and then, well, no, a day early would, I guess, because you always get there in the evening. So that's four days and then you have the swell and then we've done it where we flew out like the next day and it's just, 
it's gnarly. It's so gnarly. It's horrible. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. I, after I did that the one time, and then it's two days back, so that ends up being like seven days, I think. But uh, I would never do that again. <laughs> Are you? Do you have to camp on the beach? Or do they have accommodations? Um, there's there's places to stay. Oh. Yeah, it's not it. You're not no. You have to. It, it's kind of a long drive to yeah. get to the wave. Yeah. Um, but not camping. Right. So it's not. You're not totally roughing it or anything. Gotcha. But um, yeah, it's a lot of time. So like now nowadays, like I, I would I plan it out different, and it's hard because from the east coast, it's two days to get there. You have you want to get there a day early or really two days early if you can. Um. But those swells that the South Atlantic's small. So you're like booking your trip before the storm's even really done anything. So it's like you have to wait until the very last minute and be like, okay, the storm's in the ocean. Like it's actually big. It's actually good. Whatever. And then you can book your trip and you got to leave like the next morning. It's, it's the most, uh, one of the most hectic trips I ever do. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about family, because obviously that <laughs> limits that limits your ability to be able to pull the trigger on something like that. How old were you when you got married? Uh, Nineteen. Yeah, you were saying you and your wife going to Hawaii when you were twenty. Yeah, you had yeah. Vulcan Pipe Pro, and I was like, well, maybe he means his soon to be wife. Or no, we were married. So you were married at nineteen. Yeah. And how old were you when you had kids? I was twenty-two when we had our okay. son, and then I was twenty-five when we had our daughter. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the question is, how do you manage? those obligations with trying to pump time and energy into your surf career. Yeah. So that's, it it really feels like your surf career could just benefit endlessly the more time and effort you put into it, you know? And so I think that's where, that's where kind of some of the burnout has come in. Um, I obviously, I mean, anyone sacrifices time with their family for their job. I mean, it doesn't matter where you work nine to five, you're sacrificing. Um, It is what it is. Uh, But the amount of, I think what's been, what was hard, getting hard was the amount of hours I was putting in. And just to, just to like, be honest, like the amount of hours and time and stress that I was putting in versus what I was getting and making from it was like not equaling the time that I was like missing with my kids and stuff. Like I was literally editing until dinner. Like I'd literally be at the computer, I'd, we'd eat breakfast and then I'd sit at the computer and they would just start doing homeschool and they'd go about their day and I would edit until like 5.30, 6, 6.30 or 7, whenever my wife was like, all right, dinner's ready. And then I would like shut everything down and eat dinner with them and then put the kids to bed. And it's like, well, what am I doing? <laughs> like there was a period of time. I think part of it is that I made, as the time's gone on, I made the edits harder on myself. Um, I was starting, I had lowered the bar to be able to make edits once a week. And then as I started like getting better at it and dialing it in more, I started raising the bar on what I was going to do and how I was going to make them. And then it complicated things to where they were then taking a whole lot longer. And uh, when my kids were younger, it was a little different. Um, But now as like, they're getting older. It's like, it's hard I just, I see the disappointment in them more to where I'm like, okay, I'd like have to, I have to switch something up. I have to like restructure this the way I structured it used to work. And then something happened, something got blurred in the way my pro my process was along the way that it's not working anymore. And so that's kind of what the last year has been trying to like figure out a balance or not even the last year, the last like six, eight months trying to figure out a balance to where I can be a better dad (laughs) while also still running everything and it's not that it's not possible i just like you know and it's funny you're gonna have to delegate some of those responsibilities yeah yeah and it's funny because from the outside you would like never think that because like obviously i post videos i'm surfing with my kids or like going fishing with my kids and so like i think that's what's hard and i always try to be super transparent about stuff on instagram because i hate that i hate that you can just post like the good stuff um, and so it looks like, oh yeah, he just surfs and like gets to go fish with his kids or like surf with his kids. He's at the beach or whatever. And it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't really look like that. I mean, it doesn't, it, for, for a couple of years, like really it didn't look much different than any job you could have anywhere around here. Yeah. Uh, if anything, it was actually more hours, uh, and less pay. <laughs> um, so I'm just trying to, trying to figure out balance. Um, I mean, at, at the same time, like my wife and I have do 
Like I always spend time with them in the morning and in the evening. And I I did a couple years ago make it like a hard, like I'm not going to edit on the weekend. Like unless there's something really important going on, like I'm not going to edit on the weekend, I won't finish the video this week. I'll put it out next week. Like that's that things like that. I changed things like that instead of where there was like 2018, 19 into 2020. It was like grind, grind, grind. Like I'm going to try and make like, like basically 18 and 19, like my career was like getting to the point where it was like, okay, like this is sustainable. Like we're getting to a point where this is like makes sense. And then 2020 happened and like, you know, everybody's budgets got cut and all that stuff. And then it was just like any job anywhere. It's just like, I have a job, so I'm going to try and do whatever I can to like keep the money, like keep the bills paid. Um, but then post that it's like, okay, we need more boundaries on like making sure that, you know, I'm not working till six till dinner time. I'm not working on Saturday and Sunday and like having that time with the kids. So just, just giving it some more structure again. I think I was better at having it structured in the beginning and then it got maybe out, out of hand when it turned to like survival mode. <laughs> right. It, it totally makes sense. I understand all of that. Um, when you make a concession, like this video is going to get published next week instead of the original deadline. Yeah. Does the business suffer at all? Yeah, because, I mean, so it's funny because, like, YouTube revenue-wise, it does. Like, I, if I posted once a week every week, I'd, you know, make three to four times more than, <laughs> than I do. Um, and so, like, all those times where I, like, when I get a video out each week, it's like, a, you know, it, it, it's like a helpful paycheck. When I get one video out every other week then that's like cut in half. Yeah. Um, so then if it's one a month, it's like cut in a quarter. You know, it's like it just keeps, well, keeps, keeps going, going down. down. The big unlock for you would be hiring an editor. I yeah. know you don't well, want to do would, it. Yeah. I would just like to, I'd love to be able to hire somebody to just help me. And actually I'm in, I'm close to, because my son's 11. I'm close to like, he loves just looking at footage and help it. And like all he wants to do is just see surf footage. He loves surfing. And so I'm close to thinking about a way that he could help me organize because yeah. organizing is one of the biggest things. Jeffrey organizes a bunch of the footage. One of the things I've done in the last few months is not get the footage from him until he organizes it. And then I have to do some tweaking here and there because we have different strategies on that. But uh, yeah, the, it, the editing is the aspect I like. Honestly, the, the biggest killer is music. I, uh, because I'm five years into this now, I've had... Well, I still have and pay for uh, subscriptions on three different music sites to get music from. And I have just exhausted all three of them. There's a certain type of music. Like I'll edit to anything if it fits. But what I have found is the hardest music to find that fits that isn't just dorky and horrible is like music that fits kind of like a fast paced fun surf session. Like you know, when it's waist to chest high and you're just like ripping some turns and it's fast and quick and it's not intense, but it's not necessarily like, like childish play. Like there's some songs that I can use with like the family and the kids that are kind of more like poppy that are, or whatever. Cause it's them, but there's like a certain type there. Where it's like, Oh, this is energetic. Like we well, could make it sick. And those songs, like I'll literally, there's, there's, there's been days where I looked like six, seven hours just for, just for a song. Spent the whole day looking for one song and in a video where I need like six or five. Um, so I think a lot of it, like I said, is restructuring and, and kind of fine tuning what I'm doing and how I put the content out. Um, you know, I think these are all things that I, I've, I plan on talking about in a video soon. I just haven't shot it, but I, I'm totally fine with sharing it here. It's, uh, but like just understanding that like, okay, maybe this looks different maybe this can like kind of look how I like a little in between of like being more casual about day, like just throwing a sessions edit out without making it a whole video and then saving and making like a video out of like a good swell. Yeah. Whereas like, I kind of, like I said, I kind of pigeonholed myself into like, as time went on and my idea of like what a vlog should look like, like got narrower and narrower and narrower and more complex. Um, it got unsustainable. And so that's what I hit. And so that's what, I'm trying to figure out. Uh, how long were you with Superbrand? Ten years. Okay. Yeah. And how long have you been with O'Neill? So this is my 22nd year with O'Neill. Amazing. Yeah. My whole life. There have been, 
I got sponsored by Fox Water Sports in Buxton. And probably within the year, it was within the year, um, they got my friend Cash Barris and I hooked up with O'Neill. And uh, I remember they were thinking of picking us up or whatever. And the rep at the time, Dave Shotton from, from Virginia, was down on the island. And I don't know if Freddie told my mom or he called my mom. I forget. But my mom pulled me out of school so I could go surf at the lighthouse for like 45 minutes just so he could see me surf in person. And, uh, and then I went back to school <laughs> after lunch and um, ended up getting my first box of clothes like I don't know, a couple weeks or a month or something later. Um, how have you been able, able to maintain that relationship when so many other, you know, the entire model of <clears throat> brands sponsoring pro surfers has imploded and kind yeah. of gone away in a lot of ways. So how have you been able to maintain such so, success? I think that I'm very fortunate to have started my career with O'Neill. And I think the, the reason I still have my main sponsor is because it's an O'Neill's one of the only brands that is still like true to the core surf brand. That's not like, you know, I mean, they still have most of their team, you know, as far as like Corey and Timmy and like myself and like guys and, and Jordy has been on there for a long time now. Um, you know, I mean, I could name others, but they, a lot of other companies get, um, they get too big and they spend a lot of money. And I would say the one thing that I've noticed O'Neill has done over the last 20 years is not spend a lot of money and not get too big. They've kept the team manageable uh, and they don't go, you know, they weren't the Billabongs and Quicksilvers having like multi million dollar film battles with each other to prove who's at the top. And now you see that imploding on the back end. Uh, so they've sa- stayed sustainable. And all the guys that have worked there, um, there's one guy, you know, Garth Tarlow has been there forever. <laughs> he, I don't even know when he started, but he's definitely been there <laughs> since before me. And uh, it, so it's cool to like have someone like him who's still there, who's always been there. And the, the management has changed a little bit over the years, but not a ton. And uh, they've just, you know, they're dedicated to to just staying true to like what their roots are. They're not looking looking to sell out. And so I think that's why, you know, they still have the team they do and they, they still manage at the size they do. And, um, you know, I, I think that's part of why I still have a job. <laughs> um, what was behind the decision to leave Superbrand after 10 years? And uh, what, what's the relationship now with yeah, writing so I, boards? I don't know what actually ended up happening with Super. Um, the reason I left was because they, they were just, I don't know if they were, um, like running out of money financially or whatever. I, I don't know the whole deal, but I found out that they were, um, it was going up for sale. And I talked with the shaper, Brian, who at the time had taken, you know, he'd been shaping my boards for a number of years. And I was like, well, if they get bought out, are you going to go with them? And he said he would, if he was part of the buyout, but he wasn't sure if he was. And, uh, I was like, okay, well, if you go, I'll go. Cause like, Otherwise, I'm not going to just like go because and like get some, you know, pop outs made by whoever. And uh, I ended up getting a call from him and he was like, hey, man, like I'm not I'm not going. And so then I was like, OK, well, I'm de- I, honestly, at that point, he was the only one I knew there anymore. Um, most of the other people had either been let go or left. So I don't you know, once I I uh, talked to him and I talked to someone who was like managing i guess the supposed buyout if that's what what it was um and kind of told them what i was going to do and they were both like yeah that like we support that that makes sense and uh so yeah it was it was really hard it was really sad because like i'd been with them for so long and they like really helped make my career i mean they were just dialing me in i went from getting like three free boards a year to like 16 at my last couple years with them and it was like all of a sudden I had this crazy quiver built out where like I could bust two boards in a day and not even worry about it. Cause I had two more at home. And, uh, it was just like at a time when I was pushing myself the hardest, um, they stepped in and provided me the equipment I needed and the amount of equipment I needed, uh, and helped me dial in my boards and do my best surfing. You know, when I was like 27 to, 
to 30, that was like the most pivotal time I feel like to have to, or even 24 to 30, whatever, um, to have someone like that backing me with like quality product boards. I trusted boards that didn't snap all the time. And you know, I could break one and hop on another one. I knew exactly how it was going to go. Every time I get a batch of boards, they all rode the same. I wasn't like getting, that's why I was telling someone recently. It's like, I used to peer it before, or even now I've gotten boards where it's like, Oh, this one just doesn't go as good. And with super, it was like, they all, they all went good. <laughs> and, uh, so it was hard to leave. Um, it was, and it wasn't even necessarily like I just left them. Like the whole company was, was changing and, and I don't even actually know what happened at the, in the end, but, uh, yeah, it was pretty sad. I would, I would have loved to been with them, you know, the rest of my career and, and just been like, we made the pig dog, like they, or they made the pig dog, the barrel board, and then sent me one before it even had a name. And I took it on a trip and I was like, this thing's like, I, I literally picked it up at Delta cargo, put it in my board bag and flew to the Azores for a surfing mag trip that day. And I was like, this thing goes insane. Like I got to ride it and we tweaked it a little bit and then they started naming it and producing it. And yeah, it was, it was pretty cool to be a part of that at least. Who do you get boards from now? So now I am just riding for underneath real water sports, which is a surf shop, not a surfboard company. So when people, I tell people that they're kind of confused or people actually see, like, see me post about Lost, and they're like, Oh, you ran for Lost," Or they see me post about Paisel and they're like, you ran for Paisel. It's kind of funny. Cause it, I feel like the people who like to ride loss or like to ride Pizels just assume, see that and assume that like, oh, I'm with them. Um, but Real and I have teamed up and I'm riding anything they carry. And they carry pretty much everything. Um, so it's it's insane. Uh, Trip and them have just like present, presented. When I told them I was leaving Super, they presented the opportunity to to not, you know, they told me that they would help me like, oh, if you want to ride for loss, like we can make that happen. But then they presented the offer of like, or you could ride anything and we'll, you know, do it this way. And uh, I liked the idea and the opportunity to like try different stuff. And it's been really cool to like hop on a Pizel and then hop on a Lost or hop on a Merrick or hop on a Twin Fin. Even like I've hopped on a couple Twin Fins and some like odd shapes and it has completely opened my mind to I to realizing that I was very very narrow minded in the boards I rode. Now, granted, I was at it was at a time in my career where it was like I was just trying to make a name for myself. So it was like I need the same thing every time, and I didn't want any room for like change. And so, I think that that hurt me in a way because now we're talking with Trip and like just pulling some boards off the rack. Boards that aren't necessarily my dims, like they're close, but I would, oh, I wouldn't get it that thick or that narrow or whatever. And then ride it and be like, oh, this feels really good. Yeah. And then hopping on a, you know, a, a Merrick and then on a Pizel and being like, oh, whoa, this one feels really good in these waves. And this one feels really good in these waves. And, um, I think it's, it's made surfing really exciting again, yeah, I would say. Yeah. Not that surfing ever was like dull, but it's made it more exciting. Yeah. It opens it up for sure. Yeah. And I think, uh. I think that it's helping my surfing slowly. I mean, the hard part is not having dimensions dialed with each brand yet to where it's like I can order something that I trust. Uh, so I'm still figuring that out. But well, that's what I was going to ask is, are they all specifically off the rack or do you then dive deeper with individual shapers? Both. Uh, I haven't spoken to any shapers, but I have ordered some custom Pizels and I have ordered some custom loss. Um and then other stuff I've just pulled off. I've liked everything I've pulled off the rack, honestly. Uh, what was funny was I ordered some custom loss, and the ones I got off the rack kind of went better. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Which is further proof that you don't necessarily know everything. Like, you do yeah. get in a pigeonhole if yeah. you think you know everything. Yeah. Um, and I, but the thing was, I ordered them the same dimensions. It was like I well that that's a whole different conversation that, like, that we was, do. It was kind of weird, but we do discuss that on the podcast pretty regularly. Is that you know it's famously Kelly would get ten boards from Al Merrick yeah. that were all the same dimensions and were supposed to be identical, and then two of them were magic and the others weren't. Yeah, and yeah. that's just the nature of yeah. every blank is different, every piece of wood in the stringer is different, every lamination is different. You know that that's what tripped me out and that's what tripped me out about super was like, I did not, I'd get a batch of like six boards and I, they all felt 
it was like I was riding the same board. Interesting. I mean, I mean, there was, there was, I could only really think there was definitely, and I'm talking over like 50, 60 boards or something, like three or four that I remember would sit on the rack and I never really rode. Mm. But well, that's a <laughs> testament to maybe their their factory. They, yeah, they had being incredibly consistent. Yeah, and maybe maybe it was because they weren't making too many. Maybe. maybe there was like something about like you know because they weren't as big as Lost or or America or, like, or anything like that. And so maybe there was like it was easier to do quality control. It was like they were making enough to make a bunch, yeah. but not making so much that they don't make um, all the. I don't know. I don't know. But it was it was, that was one thing that was always really interesting. Well. The final question is just what was the last surfboard that you rode? Ooh, the last surfboard I rode was, I was just in Peru with O'Neill and I rode on the last day a Pizel Radius. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I got, I actually ordered it for Hawaii last year. I ordered that along with like a next, a couple next steps and a, and a ghost. Um, and then I didn't make it to Hawaii cause I got my ear uh, ears chiseled out for the surfer's ear surgery. And so we had the board shipped here, but, and I've wanted to ride that. I've put the, I've put that radius in my truck like eight or 10 times, but currently we're filming, uh, se- the next season of under the glass with real and Surfline, And so I've been trying to get clips on all those boards. And so I, I never, we kind of had a lackluster weird spring. I never had like enough clips of all those boards where I could then be like, okay, I'm going to hop on the radius. And so when I was down in Peru, I took it out. I only got to ride it twice because it was small most of the time. But uh, man, the board felt really good. I'm like, I'm super excited to ride it again. Uh, what is the radius? Uh, it's like their high performance shortboard. So I ordered, I want to say I ordered a Highline, um, a 510 Roundtail Highline for when I was gonna, going to Hawaii. And uh, I believe Pizel got the order and was like, wait like this board the radius is actually better for these kinds of waves and um he's like this is what like i think it was what like jack freestone and some of the other guys ride a lot around around there and so trip i I don't know if he told trip that or someone told trip that and i was like they were like what do you want to switch i was like yeah just whatever like you know more than i do (laughs) and so i went with the the radius instead of the highline it's super rockered out there's a ton of rocker in it uh nose rocker and tail rocker so when I was surfing in Peru, the couple, when I'd get like a fatter wave, I'd be like leaning in on this bottom turn and get all fat. And then you could feel the rocker. It wasn't, it wasn't as good, but the board felt really good. I can't wait to ride around here. How's Peru by the way? Um, it was a really good trip, but the waves are very small. Uh, it was a planned catalog shoot. So it wasn't, you know, necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we did get some waves. The guys, a few of the guys flew down early for a swell and got some waves. And then I got there at the very end and got one day of it. And then it got very small, but we surfed this point that was like, it was small, but man, it was so fun. I rode, uh, I rode my Christensen lane splitter there a ton and I had so much fun. I mean, it was like wasted chest high and just like bottom turn, top turn, bottom turn, top turn, car, hit off the white water, get a little barrel. Like it was small, but it was, it was a good time. Awesome. Yeah, that the relationship that you've developed with Real is innovative. Like it's oh, so it's, so cool. I could see other surfers doing that from this point on. What's funny is every trip that I've gone on uh, since last year when we started this, that is like every surfer I've run into is just like, how insane is that deal with Real? Like it trips everyone out because it's like it's so different. Um, and so I'm really excited. I mean, I feel like we've kind of barely scratched the surface with like getting it dialed. I feel like in another, in another year or two, like I'm going to have just the most wild quiver of like, you know, dialed in loss for these kinds of waves and Pizel's for these or Merrick's for these or JS or AJW, whatever it is like. And, and what's honestly been really cool for me has been, you know, trip kind of pushing me to hop on, you know, the lane splitter yeah. or like I have a, a Ryan Sakel, uh, soapbox derby which is actually uh the old fling or the new fling i guess like superbrand made the fling uh-huh. and ryan was working with superbrand at the time and helped design the fling got it and so his soapbox derby is like his version of that and uh i love that board that board's so fun so it's actually cool i'm like back on because i was that was one thing i was like man the fling was like my favorite summer board like what am i gonna ride now and now i'm back <laughs> i'm basically back on it so it's been really cool to hop on like some different some different boards. Uh, I have this really trippy, um, Reese Cole board that I got 
a couple weeks ago, but it's like a 6.0, so I kind of need some like real surf to ride it. And unfortunately, we haven't had that, so I'll be riding it this spring or this fall. And it's it's rad. Like it, it's definitely like almost information overload when it comes to like trying to think of what to order because there's so many options. Uh, so trying to fine tune that and then also be be open with it and and kind of I've I've definitely hopped on stuff where I was like, whoa, this goes really good. And, and been surprised. So it, it's really cool. It is cool. We will be watching to see how it all <laughs> develops. So thank you for taking the time to do this. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to me ramble. I can, I can definitely ramble. <laughs> no, no, it's perfect for the podcast medium, actually. <laughs> Rambling is good. All right, well, thanks. <laughs>